Let's jump into it. Uh, Mark, we heard an opening remarks from His Excellency, uh, a warning that oil is and always will be a cyclical industry. Uh, speaking of our industry, Airbus's John Leahy says that commercial aviation is no longer a cyclical business uh, because your order backlogs at Airbus and Boeing are so huge that when new orders go down, you'll just keep motoring on through. Do you agree with that assessment? I heard what His Excellency said, uh, and it's pretty pragmatic, isn't it? That uh, oil will be 50, it will be 150, it will come, it will go. It's pretty pragmatic. Look, in our business, we are really fortunate right now to live with backlogs that are enormous. That represent seven to eight years of fully subscribed production. Definitized firm contracts with dollars down. And, and what that allows us to do, certainly, is to plan forward in ways that fit the long-term investment scope for aerospace. And so for our business, when we look forward, we're not looking at the next year worrying about the question of cycle. We're instead thinking about how to make sure we have the healthiest, strongest backlog. And I think what you'll see over time is that there will be a reward to those who have the healthiest backlog. And so if you just look historically and ask the question, how did you harvest orders into deliveries? And then you measure that. I think you will see there's been a consistency in Boeing's orders translating consistently into delivery leadership over time. So I'm not sure exactly what John Leahy would have had in mind when he was asking the question about where do cycles go. I think that His Excellency's pragmatism uh, is probably pretty good common sense for all of us in any business. Uh, but in our business right now, we are uniquely positioned because of our backlogs. And the real question is the quality of any company's backlog. And we are, we are very confident in the quality of our backlog. Okay, gotcha. Let, let's talk a little bit about Boeing's international strategy. Uh, Airbus obviously had assembly, commercial assembly plants in France and Germany, has opened up plants in China, and, and now in the United States, in Mobile, Alabama. Uh, Boeing had always stressed that its strategy would be focused more on partnerships, but now you've announced plans to opening up a finishing facility in China. So do these plans in China represent a change in Boeing's international strategy, and will we see Boeing shift more of its uh, aircraft work outside the U.S.? Well, you know, Mauro Moretti just gave us a great description of what business partnerships are all about in the globalized space. And at the heart of that, as he described, was shared vision, trust, clear defined rules. Uh, that's what defines partnership. Not so much the question of what you're doing. So we've spent decades building partnership around the supply chain. We have partners who work for us who are the producers of aero structures, of systems, and of all parts of the product we manufacture. Uh, they're our partners. Likewise, what we're doing in China is in partnership. Right? We announced this as a joint venture with COMAC. Compete, collaborate. We'll do it with COMAC, just as we do it with uh, Maryland Houston and Lockheed Martin. Compete, collaborate. We see them on all sides of the playing field. So it, actually, that question, I think, gets the, uh, the, the question of what we're doing in China backwards, which is we are doing partnership, and we're continuing to do what we have long prided ourselves on doing very well. Okay, well, let, let me throw it at you another way. Can we expect to see more of these kinds of... Uh partnerships in, in other countries outside of Absolutely, China. absolutely. It's imperative. And I think the discussion this morning really brings out the clear conclusion that innovation in today's globalized world requires partnership because it's about reaching into capabilities that are broadly, uh, that are broadly available now in a way that they have never been to this extent before. It's about finding partners who have shared market interest that can support and enable the investment, the development of that capability. All of those reasons are reasons to expect that partnerships will continue to lead us out into greater and greater presence around the world. Okay. Well, Mark, I just uh, got in last night on, on Etihad, but uh, I understand that Boeing and uh, some of its partners made news here related to the environment and biofuels. Can you share a little bit of that with us? Uh, it was great to see the chart that James put up earlier this morning on the biofuels, because yes, we were just there this mor er, yesterday morning, excuse me, uh, and we had the privilege to be able to open up what's a very unique biofuel facility. It's a partnership that's known as the Sustainables Bioenergy Research Consortium. It's Boeing, it's Etihad, it's uh, Mazdar Institute, Rumubadala, and it's Takir, the, uh, the, the, the country's uh, energy company, refining company. And, and what's unique about this pilot project we opened up is that I think in, in one of the first that I've seen around the world, 
it really thinks about economic viability at the very heart of biofuels. So this is not just a facility to develop biofuel feedstock and convert it, refine it. Rather, this is an entire eco-chain. It's actually about agriculture. It's about raising fish, fish farming, right? Fish farming has historically been a very dirty production process. It's a problem, and, and yet more fish farming is needed in the UAE. And uh, what the Mazdar Institute scientists have discovered is a way to take fish farming's dirt, the, uh, the, the, what's really fertilizer if you look at it the right way, turn that around into fertilizer for desert plants. And so it's fish that live in seawater pushing off dirty water that can feed and nourish seawater-based sea plants that themselves have got terrific uh, potential for harvesting into oil, into jet fuel ultimately through a biofuel conversion process. And so you see here commercial viability driven by commercial fish farming into the farming of halophytes and the clean water were turned out the back end. It's a really neat closed loop system that's been developed. It sounds, actually sounds pretty fascinating and, and really gets to that point we heard earlier about moving away from reliance on, on natural resources for the economy here. Well, and really quick, Joe, just to interrupt. I mean, think about the partnership essential here. Who would have explored using useless desert land that was just laying barren to create part of the solution to our need to reduce emissions in aviation? Never would have come from Boeing. Never would have come either from just one of our industry partners here in the UAE. It took this consortium of our different capabilities, interests, and backgrounds to be able to do it. And this year, the thinking like this here in the UAE and our partnerships in China and in Mexico City and in South Africa and around the world on biofuels will enable our airline customers to use 600 million gallons of biofuels in flight this year, about 1% of all jet aviation fuel that's used this year. Gotcha. Yeah, speaking of China, let's jump back to China for a moment. You're, you're an old China hand. You were the president of Boeing China. And COMAC is really uh, set out to, to shatter the Boeing Airbus duopoly. Um, how long is it going to take for COMAC to become a formidable competitor, sort of the third leg of this industry? Well, they're going as fast as, as, fast as you can imagine right now. We're looking at seeing the uh, C919 take flight. They've said late in 16, 2016 or early in 2017. Um, I believe that that tracks toward deliveries in 18, 19, 20s, we'll see. So they're obviously wasting no time, and they're coming straight ahead. H how fast they'll get to be a formidable competitor, I think only history will tell. It will take time to develop out the full distribution and to develop out the fully necessary services network that will carry that product uh, to that kind of success. So we're all watching and waiting, but plainly, the world's going to be very different in 15 or 20 years, and so we all have to, we all have to operate with that in mind. Okay, so you said, you said only time will tell, but then you said 15 to 20 years. So can we assume your answer is? <laughs> you know, I'm a lawyer, Joe, so you're going to have to ask better questions. I can you really tell. Pin me down. <laughs> you're um, let's talk a little bit about innovation, which has been a cornerstone of Boeing's success. You know, dating back to the uh, B-47 swept wing, the Dash 80, 747. Um, with the 737 MAX and the Airbus A320neo, it seems the industry is becoming more incremental than transformative. Agree with that? I, I don't agree with that. Um, you know, I'll tell you, if you look at the history of aerospace, you'll see incrementalism at every step and every stage, and especially just look at the technologies that came out of World War II that then were harvested into commercial aviation technology, and there was, there was solid and strong incrementalism all across that path. So I think in many respects, it's our best heritage. Uh, right now, we have such demand pressure from our airline customers to deliver innovation to them quickly. And so the, the, the thing that we talk about at Boeing is how do we accelerate our innovation? We have got to be able to accelerate to the customer the values uh, that they hold most dear. So efficiency, the passenger experience, uh, things that can transform their success in their marketplaces. And the only way for us to really accelerate innovation is to make sure that we take our incremental developments and push them out into production faster, not slower. So the idea that incrementalism, because incrementalism suggests, I think, a slowness and a small step nature, it's actually about innovating faster and making sure that we pull through innovative technologies into constantly evolving product. There's no reason why the airplane industry shouldn't be like every other industry that's out there where product is constantly evolving. And that's really where I think our focus has been and what many of our public statements have been about. So, so when you talk about innovating faster, there's a project at Boeing called Black Diamond, I sure. believe. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about that and how that applies to innovating and in, in manufacturing? Yeah, the, the heart of Black Diamond is about automation. 
And of course, there's not you know, much of a better environment we could be in than here in Abu Dhabi to speak about automation because the workforce issues join right up with the need for automation. Uh, in our business, and both the defense and on the commercial side, when we can automate, we can radically change the cost proposition for building out our products. And it's something we need to do. We need to be, to be able to be competitive and then to win in the marketplace, we have got to be more competitive in our cost structure and automation is, is part of driving that forward. So with Black Diamond, this was a project that began our def defense side but has now transitioned over to the commercial side. And you'll see different bits of automated technology showing up in our production system that are the result of it. Uh, not a direct connection, but another uh, example is to point you toward what we're doing on the 777. Uh, we've created the FOB, the Fuselage Automated Upright Build, which is uh, it's joining together components of the fuselage with an automatic, you know, with an automated drill and fill process. And we're seeing terrific success from that. Terrific success in quality, terrific success in flow and rate times, uh, what we need in order to be successful into the new century of our, of our existence. Yeah, you, you said radically change, so does that mean you were to expect a radical uh, improvements in manufacturing costs? You know, Joe, if you, it's really great. If you take the pictures of Rosie the Riveter driving, you know, drilling and filling a hole, you know, from 60 years ago, and you put those up next to what it looked like to see us join a fuselage about five years ago, you would have seen no difference. I mean, it just the processes look the same. There are slight evolutions around some of the, the, the tools and the hydraulics and the like, but the fundamental of the process look the same. Now, when you put the picture of the fob up next to Rosie the Riveter and you see what this automated build looked like, there's no word that could fairly describe it except for radical change. Okay, great. We heard it here. Um, we focused a lot about commercial. Let's talk briefly about uh, defense and space. How, how, does a, how does a giant company like Boeing stay competitive against you know upstarts like SpaceX that are very nimble and and, and have a culture of, of, of cutting cost and doing things quickly how do you stay innovative against these these new young upstarts I, I think the entire industry is asking itself that question right now because we are we're seeing myths that have long stood the test of time being challenged reusability of course is, is a great example in rocketry the question of trying to land and reuse a rocket I'll tell you though you know in our space we say that's interesting but what's really interesting is when you can reuse the engines in the rocket. So the way that we have to stay nimble and be ahead of them is to figure out what are the questions like that to ask, what are the places to really invest in technology, not, not just to invest in newness for newness sake, but really to understand the business model and invest ahead of our competitors in those places. So that's what you'll see us doing. Okay. Well, Mark, unfortunately, we're, we're limited in our time here, but I would like to wrap up with, a, with to ask you to make a prediction which is, the question is, which country will be the next to put humans on the moon, and which will be the first to land humans on Mars? I thought Matt Damon already got there. I thought we already established that earlier today. <laughs> um, I, look, China has declared a path to the moon that uh, makes it seem you know, pretty predictable that China will be the next to put, uh, put a man on, uh, on the moon. Um, in terms of Mars, you know, it'd be easy to say the U.S. only because of the scope and the dedication of our program to, to a Mars program. However, I think the, the real answer is likely to be a global consortium. I mean, we're here talking about innovation and partnership, uh, and we have all seen in our respective uh, budget environments the pressure on innovation into space and other aspects of government spending, and it seems not at all unlikely that the answer to those pressures is going to be governments of the world banding together to do such a great undertaking. We've got a great model in the International Space Station, so there's no reason why we couldn't do it that way. It will just take significant political will and significant political goodwill. So we'll see if we can develop that and drive that. Okay, great. So China to the moon and international effort to the Mars. Thanks for having us, Joe. Mark, thanks, thanks for your time. Really appreciate it.